Well, hello, I'm Stephen Devine. I'm the uh, one of the principal keyboard players for the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, and I'm currently sitting in my kitchen in deepest, darkest Kent. And across s Skype, um, I am absolutely thrilled to be discussing life, the universe, and everything with the tenor writer and general all-round uh, intellectual thinker of, of music and life, uh, Ian Bostridge. So good afternoon, Ian. Hello, what a nice introduction. I'm sitting in my <laughs> sitting room, which is where you're supposed to sit, in darkest Kentish town. So. Darkest Kentish town, very nice. Um, as you will probably have seen by the time this goes out, um, um, by the way, for those that uh, think that all this is seamless technology, this is the second attempt we've had at this since um, our first attempt, which uh, sort of went slightly wrong due to the vagaries of the internet, which I'm sure is a problem that everybody across the world is having at this precise moment as the yeah. world struggles to do meetings on Zoom. But yeah. we also have um, input from our principal horn player, Roger Montgomery, who um, can't join us for this, but really wanted to um, put certain things in place. So he very kindly has recorded the prologue and the epilogue to the serenade of ten horn strings. Lovely. And uh, we'll see him around. Anyway, yeah. Um, so yeah, so here we are in lockdown again. Does uh, how how weird is it for you? I mean, do you have lots of things that you can be getting on with, or has life stopped for you, or how does it work? Um, well, I've got lots to be getting on with, and I mean, at the beginning uh, of the whole process, I thought, well, this is a jolly good thing because I get to spend more time with my family, and I can go for walks on Hampstead Heath with my children, and I can write the lectures that I haven't hadn't been spending enough time writing but as time goes on and it becomes more and more of a question how we're going to start up again it uh that you know it slightly gets to one but I mean you know people are coming up with good ideas I mean somebody this morning said to me you know maybe we'll have repeat concerts with half full halls um Ooh. which is, is a you know means maybe the concerts are a bit shorter and you have a six o'clock concert and an eight thirty concert and you do the same program twice and uh but you've still got to get into the, you've still got to clamber over people, haven't you? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, there's a lot of the music that you do. I'd imagine the leader aspect of it, and a lot of the music that I do, sort of particularly on the quieter end of the keyboard spectrum, the clavichords and the harpsichords. Actually, yeah. it might it might suit a smaller venue doing something twice. That's not a bad yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just re yeah. rethink the rethink the concert going thing. I like yeah. that. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. I'm, I think I might do that anyway. I think it sounds yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds a really great yeah. thing. So yeah. um. I mean, you mentioned lectures. You've obviously um, you've written books in the past. Is 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 this the next thing for you? Writing lectures and will these be published? Um, I've done lectures, some lectures before. Um, I did a, a lecture at um, the the Centre for the Study of Dance, bizarrely, because I know nothing about dance in um, in New York. <laughs> but uh, I'd found out something and tried to relate dance to what I do because they wanted to have a non dancer talking about dance. And uh, wow. Also, bizarrely, I gave a lecture in uh, at the University of Trondheim, the inaugural um, uh, Nicholas Breakspeare lecture. Nicholas Breakspeare was the the first was the only English pope, Adrian the Fourth, and they wanted for me to talk for, for me to talk about the importance of of, of Latin. <laughs> well, um, but I I managed something and also discovered that Nicholas Breakspeare was a very good singer, and that was one of the things people found particularly attractive about his spirituality it was but it was mediated through his voice so that was nice um but these lectures are for the university of chicago um a series sponsored by a family called the berlin family and they are um they're going to be about three different pieces of mainly focused on three different pieces of music which sort of somehow relate to the themes of race gender and death. So the first piece is the Chanson Madikas of Ravel. The second piece is uh, Frauen Lieben und Leben of Robert Schumann. And the third piece is uh, the Holy Sonnets of John Donne by Benjamin Britten. And with the first two, it's partly an issue of, you know, an issue of, of ident how identity is mediated through song, how worked up do we get about, about I don't know, colourblind casting, or we seem to get less worried about it in in um in say an opera because there just aren't that many people who can sing or tell i mean you'd never cast nowadays unless it was as a gimmick with an all-black cast you wouldn't cast a i mean you may maybe you'd cast a white othello but in the play generally you would cast somebody black or moorish or whatever uh you wouldn't go for colorblind casting but in in othello because there are very few people in the world who can sing othello you have to take what you can get and so that 
I mean, that has been an issue. It's been an issue, I think, in, in the sense of how do you present the role in that context. Anyway, Chanson Madicas is is a is a song, a set of songs, uh, based on poems, prose poems by Evariste Parny, who wrote them in the seventeen eighties, and he wrote them. He said he he was just translating them from the Malagasy, which he probably wasn't, but he certainly knew a lot about Malagasy culture. Culture, but they are about Malagasy life, and they're also in the second song. They're they're a, they're a, a sort of protest against against attempts at colonization, and they're very fierce. And in a sense, very political and anti-slavery, anti-colonization. They almost have a taste of um, of the famous uh, political thinker of the, of the 1960s, France, France Fanon. They're that sort of violent. But at the same time, the agency is afforded to these opinions through the medium of a of a, a Creole, but nevertheless white, colonial poet, Ravel. Uh, a Frenchman who was sort of semi-implicated in colonialism simply by being part of that society, and what you know, who can or should should we sing them? Shouldn't we sing them? Who should sing them? Uh, what's going on? And I want to sort of explore those issues in a way that doesn't offend anyone, <laughs> because it's, a, <laughs> it's one of those. I mean, it's one of those areas where I mean, the same with gender. I mean, with Fran Liebmann Leben, I'm you know, the first performance of Fran Liebmann Leben was by a man actually. The poems oh, are by I didn't know that. Yeah, Gosh. the poems are by a man. The mm-hmm. music's by Man. Uh, they're, they're, they're a bit sort of... Um, they make people feel a bit queasy because they seem to be very sexist. But if you explore them more, you can find out that they're not, in the context of the times, unduly sexist. They're actually... They're, there's some quite interesting things going on with them. And also, you know, should a, you know, I will probably, in the, at the beginning of the lecture, sing one of them. And is that weird? Or And people do sing yeah. them now. I mean, Matthias Gerner has sung them. Yes, indeed. To, to sing a song about being pregnant is, you know, interesting as a man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it happens when all the the, the women sing um, sort of men's songs from Schubert yeah. and things like yeah. that. I mean, you you get the same sli- slightly odd crossover, and somehow the the, the gender displacement of, of women singing a man's song because yeah. of this eighteenth century tradition of um, sort of men playing women on the stage, it, it doesn't feel quite so weird. Uh, even yeah. I don't quite know yeah. where I'm going with that one, but um, I mean, I've o- it- I've often wanted to reclaim not I've often wanted to reclaim a lot of. Um, Repertoire that's usually sung by women. Not it's usually repertoire that's sung by women in the voice of a man. So I've sung yes. Scheherazade, Les Nuits d'Été, which is very often sung by. But yes. in, the, in the in the I mean, you you mentioned the other day, Silati Venti is, is usually yeah. sung by a soprano. But it's really nice to. I mean, I found it really incredibly fun to sing it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I mean. Do, with these lectures, I mean, incredible subjects. So is this something that you've been thinking about for an awfully long time, or is this something that you've been commissioned to think about, or, or just just where does your interest in, particularly the Ravel, where does that come from? Where I suppose well, the Ravel, I got to know the Ravel a long time ago, um, um, when uh, um, a great, wonderful singer, friend of mine, Ruby Philogene, um, who is Af- uh, whose parents are Afro Caribbean, and um, this was. 20, 25 years ago, gave the most incredible performance of these songs in the Wigmore Hall. Um, and it was just very, to have Ruby stand up in the middle of this very, very, certainly at that time, very, I mean, there was, there was a time when John Burt said the BBC was hideously white. And there was a, there's a real sense that, you know, at that, that time, the, the Wigmore Hall was a very, you know, middle class, white, sort of, I mean, it's, it's now working, it works incredibly hard to be, to reach out, I think, as an institution. Yes, of course. Um, but um, it was very shocking to have somebody stand up and sing, beware of the white people, inhabitants of the, of the, of the, um, of, of the shores. It's, it, it, right. it was, it was very, it was one of the most, and she's such an amazing singer. Um, it was such an incredible performance and that lodged in my brain, I suppose. Mm. Um, we then, around that time, were going on to do, um, a staging by Deborah Warner of, of Diary of One Who Vanished by Janacek, which has in the figure of the gypsy a sort of racial element going on because one of the things that's shocking for the people for whom the, this piece came out in the early 20th century was the sort of relationship between, you know, pure racial Czech peasant boy or Wallachian peasant boy and a gypsy who had dark skin mm. and mm. um so that's also set me I mean race isn't something you often confront in certainly in the leader repertoire n- not really much in the baroque repertoire um you do a lot in 19th century opera um because exoticism and colonialism are a huge part of 19th century opera but um 
that so I but I mean I had didn't perform them for ages I loved them and then I about two years ago at this wonderful festival in Italy called La Foce I had got the opportunity to do them with um Christian Polterra playing cello and and, and Emmanuel Paud and we, we did this um this performance and I just loved the pieces but then I thought to myself what what does it mean for me what did it mean when the poems were written in the 1780s yeah. For this slave, basically this man from a slave owning family to write these poems. What did it mean for Avell in the middle of the 1920s, commissioned by a social reformer, Winneretta Singer, the Princess de Polignac, who commissioned so much chamber music? Um, also in the middle of, you know, the phase of, of Parisian culture called negrophilia, where, you know, Josephine Baker was dancing and people were going crazy for, for African American jazz and for um, African. Afro Caribbean, African American, French African people on stage. The sort of, and then maybe as a reaction against that, the movement in the 1930s called Negritude, which was the first big um, movement of, you know, uh, blackness as a political issue. I mean, yeah. different from, get from Fanon, who I mentioned before. But um, so I, it, and I, the thing was, I got, I got asked to do these lectures and I was rather intimidated by the idea because the other people who'd given them, I mean, the first one was, um, was um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And then after that, there were sort of um, people who worked on issues that connected very much with, with politics and, you know, global warming. And I was thinking, God, am I just going to give another lecture about Winterreiser? <laughs> um, and then I suddenly thought about, about Chanson Magicasse and I thought it's a sort of a bit of, a, it's quite a dangerous subject in a way. Because, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other things came out of that, I think. Oh, yeah. brilliant. Well, it sounds amazing, absolutely. What a, God, what a thing. And and did you say in the last conversation that these will probably be published at some point? As... Yes, these will be published by, by um, Faber and the University of Chicago Press next year, Fantastic. assuming that, that anything is happening next year. Yeah, well, yes, yes, if this <laughs> stops. So, brilliant. Um, we're obviously talking on the... Uh, to sort of... Because we were due to be performing together with the orchestra, um, a, a really fascinating programme of restoration music in the first half, and then the second half... Um, Warlock's Capriol Suite and Britain's Serenade for Tenor, Horn and Strings. Um, in your experience, do you, do you sort of like this juxtaposition of, of two uh, opposing, not opposing, uh, two different genre, or, or do you do you have to put your brain somewhere else in the, at the interval? I I like it because I feel, in in one sense, I mean I feel I'm aware of style, but on the other hand, I feel I sing the same whatever I sing. I find. I mean, it's all about projecting emotion through text and music, um, and I've I've always been interested in the idea about about mixing these things up. I mean, I did a I did a season at the Wigmore some years ago called Ancient and Modern, where we we had early music and 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 so called modern music in the same in the same program. And you know, I even tried to get uh, tried to sort of break down the barriers by getting. The modern music to be played but on early instruments and trying to get the same players to play in both halves but in the end it was too the, the oh, union yes. rules were too strict oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no i mean that's they aren't really union rules but you know what i mean it's all these I things do, are yeah. sometimes more complicated than you think they're going to be even the practicalities are more difficult in terms of you know, i i think that's the thing isn't it shifting the you know shifting the step how you work i mean even how i wanted to have i wanted to have a modern piece and an ancient piece in each half but of course, we couldn't do that because it was too complicated in terms of shifting everything around. So we had to have modern in one. Anyway, um, yeah, no. So I'm, I think it's. A, I love that idea of mixing mm. mixing it up. Yeah. Oh, well, I think it's. I mean, there's obviously a, a big crossover with things like Britain. You know, being such a passionate advocate for Purcell's music, and, yes. and we've got we've got all those. What do you think of the the, the sort of Britain realizations? I mean, how does that sit in your repertoire of being such a sort of experienced singer with period instruments and with somebody like Julius Drake? Um, well, I've always loved um, one particular realisation, the Queen's Episodium, which I, I was introduced to years ago by Graham Johnson when he did a complete recording of, of the Purcell realisations. And at the same time, I was singing the Holy Sonnets of John Donne a lot, and it seemed to, really seemed to connect the sort yeah. of with that the the force of them and the weight of them and the gravity and it, and it it's funny going back then and singing with with sl with more delicate forces it's a different in some sense it's a different piece um, yeah um but i i love some of them and some of them i find a bit tricky i mean i music for a while i like the tippet because i think it's a bit more yeah uh true to the material somehow i know that, that from my from my experience as a keyboard player that having played a million um, auditions when the Tippett and the Britain realisations come onto the piano. I know that it 
the thing I find interesting is, is that it changes the relationship between the keyboard player and the singer because uh, as a continuo player on the harpsichord I'm used to sort of just giving the singer what they want and reacting to, you know, so if you change yeah. something on the spur of the moment, I can. But obviously, if you've got a written down realisation, yeah. uh, whatever quality, you've kind of got to play it. So you're yeah. going to have to wait for my little flourish here yeah. to, to disappoint that. So that's the only thing that I find tricky about them. But I must say that I do, that the artistry, I think, and, and it's actually that the Queen's episode I am, is, is the one that I do think is the most successful because the composition is such a... It's not a verse song. It's a, a through composed, very yeah. complex, very speech rhythm based piece. Yes. And I've, yeah, I, I think that's where he really excels. So it, it's absolutely amazing, really. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's it was it was fascinating um, talking to Roger Montgomery, our principal horn player, about this because he told me, of course, as as we did when we first spoke about this, that one of the fascinating things is, is that. This is a period of Benjamin Britten that, that we actually have recordings for. Of course, we have. Yes. Um, uh, we've got not only documentary evidence; we've even got the pictures and the and the TV program to prove it, and we can see what happened. Yeah. And Roger was saying that, that that one of the interesting things is that the the actual horns that we used during Britain's lifetime have changed. And actually, I think we've got a clip about Roger talking about the horns, which is probably a good time to do now. Yeah. One of the interesting things about playing this piece. Is not, not only do we know so much about the performers, but we have recordings and can even see and play some of the instruments that were used for these recordings. And they tell quite a story. Dennis Brain, the virtuoso horn player for whom Benjamin Britten wrote the horn part, originally played an old 19th century French piston horn that was largely superseded in Europe and was becoming obsolete in England. But the next time he recorded the work, he was using a rotary valve German horn, essentially a modern horn. These instruments can be seen and occasionally played in the, li in the libraries of the Royal College of Music and the Royal Academy of Music, respectively. But it does raise the inter interesting question uh, in original instrument performance, which is which one is actually appropriate for the piece? Uh, it's not a question that's easy to resolve, given that the composer in endorsed recordings uh, using both of these instruments. Uh, sadly, this performance won't be going ahead um, on Friday. But uh, it does spare me the having to make the choice between a modern instrument, a modern style instrument, and the old instrument. However, I have recorded the prologue and epilogue um, on one of each, so you can hear the difference, hopefully. Bye. 
Another advantage of having recordings is that what might ordinarily be a moot point of interpretation can easily be settled. For example, in the prologue and epilogue, the horn plays using the uncorrected natural harmonics of the horn in F. Two of these in particular are hauntingly out of tune. There's the written F, which is easily interpreted as the 11th harmonic, thus. And a bit later. Now, the, the next one that he writes is written as an A, and that's a little bit harder to interpret on the face of it, because there is no harmonic that relates directly to A in the harmonic series. And uh, in choosing whether it's the, the note below it or the note higher than it in the harmonic series, you could easily make the wrong choice. Um, it'd be more natural to pick this note than this one. which everyone who knows a Britain Sone knows is the right way to play it. But that's not what Britain actually wrote. Um, and there are very few interpretations of this work on record where people pick the lower option. So I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, Roger's been doing a lot of work about kind of what instruments to use, and we were starting to explore before, unfortunately, the concert had to be postponed. Um, although I do think we get to do it next year, I think, this, I think this so. same thing. Yeah, the yeah. tour of the Far East at least. Yeah. Let's, well, yeah. let's keep our fingers crossed for that one. Well, if yeah. it's, you know, Korea, Korea seems to have dealt with it very well, so maybe they'll be, and they're so, I mean, it's so wonderful in Korea, the enthusiasm for, for, for so-called classical music is so huge. Yeah, that, it's brilliant, uh, really right. good. So I, I think this is the latest that the OAE's ever gone forward in terms of repertoire and performance practice, of course, working out kind of what are we trying to do with this. Um, and... Because we have this documentary evidence, I mean, you must feel it really strongly that we've got Peter Pears, obviously, <laughs> with such a distinctive style of performance and such a, a sort of um, a strong association with the work for, for many people as much as anything else. Do you, do you feel that weight? Do you have Peter Pears sat on your shoulder thinking, oh, I've got to do this because he does it all? How does that affect you? Um, I think I did when I started doing the piece and I did it an enormous amount in my early years. Um, it was one of the first pieces I did even before I became a professional singer that I did in 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 pub. I mean, a full time professional singer. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I did it a lot, and I did I listened to Piers a lot, and I always loved particularly the the recording from the the studio recording from the forties with with Dennis Brain, and not so much the later one because I thought the voice was a bit more a bit more I don't know weird, a bit more that curdled quality that he sometimes has. So there's this incredible freshness about the first recording. Mm. Um, but as you get, the more you sing a piece and also the older you get, you just, you work, you, your voice. It's one of the things about interpretation, actually. I mean, people talk about interpretation. People, you know, some people are singing teachers. I've never been a singing teacher because I wouldn't really know how to teach technique. But you, you give masterclasses if you're someone like me. And masterclasses about, are supposed to be about interpretation. But of course, such a huge amount of what you do with a piece is down to two physical i mean they're to do with who you work with obviously but there are two two physical factors which really affect what becomes available to you interpretatively the first of which is your is the basic feeling and basic sound of your voice and what it's doing and then actually acoustic and you often find you come up with new interpretations and in different acoustics because it allows you to you feel you can do different things it, i mean it may it's what you get back from the room but mm. um so i th i think my you know and I'm even now I'm relearning how to sing the Britain Serenade because it got it was sort of it was quite easy but a bit but the certain moments were a bit scary at the beginning but uh, listening back to old recordings the moments that I thought were scary were actually perfectly okay and through as I've got older the voice has got heavier it's it's become more anxiety ridden and now I'm working on it again and finding new ways of singing it with a, what's essentially a slightly different instrument so yeah um, yeah yeah. I mean, that's always a thing with singers, isn't it? As as you get older, I mean, female and male singers, that as you get older, the, the actual instrument changes because, you know, physically you change. And so yeah. that that must be quite a, a an interesting thing. I mean, I would imagine scary because, you know, I know what a harpsichord feels like. It's been the same one for yeah. since, for, for 15 years in here. But um, you, guys, you guys, I suppose you've got to re and rework with it all the time and see what yeah. it's going to do. And you don't want to lose the things that you're sort of... 
you know that you do well. Yeah. Uh, like sort of, you know, soft mezzo voce singing and sort of being... But on the other hand, if the voice is getting bigger, you've got to cope with that. And um, Yeah. But the nice thing is about the voices, you know, sometimes you can think, oh, God, I'm, 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 it's just a slow decline from here on in. But, <laughs> but I always remember one of my earlier singing teachers saying, um, oh, yeah, the voice gets better and better until you're in your 50s. And then I, my new singing teacher the other day said, oh, yeah, your voice just gets bigger and bigger until at least 65. So, you know, you just feel it, new possibilities are offered as long as you... I think as long as you engage with it and aren't, yeah. I've, I've, I've been a bit, I've sort of been backing off it, I think a bit and thinking, oh, well, this is the way it is. And it's really nice to find, it's one of the, again, one of the nice things about lockdown, as long as there's some work after we finish. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, that um, I found new things, to, new ways of using my voice. So, um. And other things already that you feel you can do better or even at all that you couldn't do when oh, you were yeah. younger. Yeah. Well, but I, you know, I'd, I had this thing the other the other the other month where I sang Schwanengesang um, in an opera house and the intendant of the opera house who was uh, who was planning going to another opera house and planning Lohengrin in three years time said would you sing Lohengrin and I said I basically I thought I, I was sort of polite and then I went and asked various people and they said no you're right it's no and then I went to this new teacher and he said what and I sang a lot to him and he said well if if you'd asked me cold, I would have said how ridiculous. But your voice has changed, and I mean maybe I will never sing Lundgren, but there are there are things I can certainly there's there are possibilities out there for me to, for mm. different things for me to do because the voice is a bit different. Well, that's very exciting. Have, have yeah. we heard have we heard something that's a possibility for Bostridge of the future here? Yeah, well, maybe. Oh, wait, what about OAE doing? Have you done Wagner? Uh, we've done Wagner, yes, yeah, we did Rheingold, a very, very well-received Rheingold with Rattle um, at the Proms a number of years ago, and there's yeah. various bits and bobs coming up in the season. Um, I'll let um, them put it on the screen if if I'm missing something terribly important. Um, yeah. But <laughs> it's the, the yeah. thing of not being briefed properly, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, well, there we go. We'll stick that in the mix. This, yeah. this could be exciting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so your association with the orchestra goes back a number of years and actually yours well our association goes back for the, for the same degree I've, we've done some very happy collaborations which i'm very proud of um we've done some bach we've done yeah. some handel the aforementioned siletti venti and um, i've forgiven the orchestra i remember the very first i now remember the very first <laughs> i think the very first concert i did with the orchestra which again was before i become a, became a full-time singer i was i had to stand under the stage in the queen elizabeth hall and sing a bit of zaida with would it have been Adam Fisher or Ivan Fisher? Um, Probably Ivan at their stage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that must have been like thirty years ago, <laughs> singing in singing in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, before my time, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we've so we've done those, and this we did a very happy um, concert in Poland at Katowice, didn't we last yeah. year? Which was and um, just before you went for a major surgery, I see. Yes, to I went for I was I went went under the knife or under the extremely. Uh, vicious uh, electric saw, which which opened up, gave me what do they call it? Um, uh, in, uh, anyway, they opened up my rib cage and fiddled around with my a- aorta and wrapped it up with something. But they didn't oh, have to. Goodness. It was very good because they didn't have to do any of the things they used to do, like stop your heart or put a new valve in or or give me warfarin. So I'm as good as new, except I have a, I have a very interesting scar on my. Yes, I bet. Yeah, well, fantastic. And have you been... Which would be good for Parsifal, actually, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I like this fishing for work. I think it's great. Die Wunder, die Wunder. <laughs> so, I mean, have you been back at full strength since then? I mean, is it? Is yeah. it, are you totally recovered? That's amazing. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. But I mean, that's, that's the, the right thing. thing is it's sort of, it all started up again in September slowly, then very busy from October, and, and then suddenly in March. Yes. Everything goes... Casplat. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's looking out for you, giving you a rest in the middle of it all. Yeah. Don't don't yeah. overdo it too early. Well, that's fantastic. Great news that you're better. I'm really pleased to yeah. hear it because I think we were about five, six days before you were going back straight into yeah. it. Yeah. Terrifying. Well, you wouldn't have known it from that concert anyway. Uh, um, so do you... Um, the thing I, I remember about that and, and was looking forward to and I'm still looking forward to is that when we did 
handle and uh, particularly the handle, I seem to remember. We was we we talked quite a lot about um, just kind of in expression and ways of expression and phrasing and how how we did things, and, and it was it was really really interesting. But when we did personal together, we kind of just got on with it. We just did it, yeah, and uh, yeah. very little discussion. Is that because? you and I think the same way about it or do you think it's just that the actual nature of the music is much more I hesitate to say proscriptive um, but I don't know I think maybe it is but I think there is that also that thing of being used to performing with each other uh, yeah um, yeah uh, and, and feeling breath and phrasing and in the same way yeah uh, but I, I, I can see what you mean about Purcell being more prescriptive yeah right? There's, there's so I mean you know the things all the all the repertoire we did for that so the Queen's episode I am uh, um, just just Purcell is so precise about his notation in some some ways and it, it's it's quite easy to yeah. over interpret it which actually is something that doesn't seem to happen here which is, is rather rather wonderful yeah. so so yeah it, it, it's well it was a, a a very happy collaboration I look forward to quite a lot a lot more of those um, yeah. Well, Ian, thank you so much for talking to me. I hope that we all meet again very soon in yeah. the flesh, as it were. Yeah. And um, I look forward to performing together. I hope we hope we get to do this concert, which is a, a wonderful programme. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks. Shall all, shall all, shall all your cares be gone?